All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice question series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. Those materials will be updated to the sixth edition. So if they aren't already, that's going to happen within the next week or so. So be on the lookout for that. If you're watching this in the future, then that should already be done. Other than that, keep working hard, keep studying hard. Let us know when you pass. Let's get going. Grant is implementing a skill acquisition program targeting turn-taking for a child with autism. After three weeks, Grant reviews the data and notices little improvement in turn-taking since the start of the program. The parents, on the other hand, tell Grant they have seen a big improvement. What should most guide Grant's decision on where to take the intervention from here? So there's a lot of different ideas in our task list about collaboration, how we make decisions, and data-driven results. So when you're an analyst, you're going to typically have a lot of things to consider when evaluating programs. So the question wants to know, how does Grant decide where to take the intervention? We know he has this program targeting turn-taking. It's been three weeks. Grant sees the data. The data show little improvement. That's not great, right? However, you've got stakeholders like parents telling Grant that they've seen a big improvement. So the question becomes, does Grant trust data or does Grant go with the stakeholders and how they are perceiving the change? Well, what Grant wants to do is go with the data first. Even though the parents feel like they've seen a big improvement, we've got to trust the data initially. Now we've got to work within the bearings of this question, but in practice, you're going to want to review data collection as well. But given the fact that Grant wants to or needs to go with the data first, what should Grant do here? Where should he take the intervention? Well, he should he A, guide, should his decision be guided based on A, the observations of the parents, B, the data Grant reviewed, C, Grant's own observation of the behavior, or D, feedback from Grant's technician working on the case. Well, D is not going to make sense. He's not going to take the feedback. The data that are being taken should be the technician's feedback. The data are what we are going to trust. C, Grant's own observation, and A, the observation of the parents. Those are both subjective observations, although they are observations. Grant, regardless of the outside opinion, has to go with the data and start to think about how can he improve his skill acquisition program. This is a difficult thing to do when you've got a lot of different opinions coming at you. That's why we always, always, always want to trust our data and use our data to guide our decision making. You, a behavior analyst, accept a case that requires specialized knowledge and training in feeding disorders. You have almost no experience with feeding disorders, but are comfortable with the behaviors that were reported. What would not be a potential risk associated with taking this case and not seeking additional training or guidance? So we have a potential risk question, and there are potential risks associated with taking cases, your treatment plans. There's always some aspect of risk, right? Our number one priority is not to do harm. So if you were to take this case and not seek additional training, what's a risk? What do we know about the case? The case needs specialized knowledge and training in feeding disorders. You have no experience, but you take the case because you're comfortable with the behaviors. What could possibly go wrong? A, there is potential risk of harm to the client if a feeding emergency were to occur. That is absolutely a risk. B, if behavior is related to feeding, then behavior planning may not be effective. That's true. If the behavior is associated with feeding, you might not be able to create the best behavior plan. C, you will develop better rapport with the stakeholders as they help you navigate the feeding disorder. That could be true, it could not be, but it's not a risk. Better rapport would not be a risk, that's a benefit. And remember, the question is asking what would not be, keyword not, be a potential risk. So far, C is our only answer. D, you may harm the reputation of ABA as a profession. The task list and ethical code now discuss the reputation of ABA, right? We want to protect our profession 
which has gotten at times a bad reputation in the past. We want to protect our profession because we know the value it brings. In this case, what is not a risk? Not a risk is developing better rapport. That will be a benefit of anything. There is risk to harm the client. There is risk you don't know how to handle the behavior if it's related to feeding. And there is risk you could harm the reputation of ABA if you do bring harm to the client. So what is not a risk? You develop better rapport. Tom, a behavior analyst, is tracking a client's social skills progress through observation of their interaction with peers once a week in an after-school program. Tom is starting to realize the client's behavior varies significantly from week to week, possibly because peers and activ activities change each week. How could Tom improve reliability of data collection in the program? So we have a data collection question, and we know data needs to be accurate, reliable, and valid. When we talk about reliability, what are we mean? What do we mean? We are saying we want to be able to collect data on the same thing over and over and over again and collect the same type of data, the same amount of data, just to be able to measure what we're trying to measure repeatedly. In this case, Tom is tracking social skills through observation of interaction with peers once a week. He is seeing that the client's behavior varies significantly from week to week because peers and activities change. So if the behavior and the peers and activities are changing each week, the data aren't going to be very reliable because you're going to be measuring something different every week. How could Tom improve reliability given those facts? A, observe the client in different environments each week. Well, that likely isn't going to help the fact that things are not consistent. If we put the client in a different environment, there's a lot more stimuli, stimuli to react to. The peers and activities might continue to change, and we've just added a different variable. A, does not seem to help. B, ask the after-school staff to start collecting data as well. The data aren't necessarily the issue, right? If the after-school staff collects the same data that Tom is collecting, they're still collecting data on a behavior that is always changing. C, standardize when data is taken on the client. This would be a good goal. Standardize when that data are taken, right? If we can standardize a procedure and standardize a situation, let's say we get the client with the same peers and the same activities, then we can isolate this to where maybe behavior isn't changing as much. So C seems pretty good. D, switch to two observations per week instead of one. Well, you're still just collecting data during a situation where variables are constantly changing. Peers are changing, activities are changing. That's the problem. We have to prevent all this change. And the best way to do that is standardize when the data is taken on the client. A company is evaluating two different training programs for onboarding new employees. Program Alpha requires 20 training sessions for each employee to meet performance criteria, while Program Omega requires only 12 sessions for the same outcomes. Additionally, Program Alpha costs twice as much as Program Omega. What program could be more efficient? When we think about the six edition task list, we talk about efficiency. And one of those ideas behind efficiency is a cost-benefit analysis. With a cost-benefit analysis, we want to look at the cost of interventions or programming and compare those to the benefits and then pick the best one. In this case, there are two different programs. One, Alpha, requires 20 training sessions, so 20 total sessions. Omega requires 12 for the same outcomes. So immediately, there's a higher cost for Alpha because it's going to take longer. Training duration impacts efficiency. Additionally, Alpha costs twice as much as Omega. So not only does it take longer, it's more expensive. Clearly, what's going to be more efficient? A, Alpha because it would take longer, leading to more intensity. Well, that's not efficient, right? Being, taking longer doesn't mean it's going to be efficient. Also, assuming more intensity is not backed by any information given in the question. B, Omega, because it takes about half the time and is more cost efficient. That's both true. It does take about half the time and it costs about twice as less as Alpha. 
C, alpha because the cost of their program would indicate a higher value program. Again, not necessarily, and no information indicates that given the question. Given our information, omega is going to be more efficient because of our cost benefit. Not only is training duration, duration reduced, but also cost is almost twice as less as alpha. So omega is going to be more efficient. A soccer coach is working with the player to improve their penalty kicks. Initially, the coach praises the player for just hitting the ball in the direction of the goal. As the player progresses, the coach only provides praise when the ball hits the upper corners of the goal. Over time, the player consistently improves their aim and accuracy. What dimension of behavior is the coach shaping? When we ask ourselves what dimension we are shaping, we have to ask ourselves what's changing about the behavior. Is it the look of the behavior or is this some other aspect? In this case, we're working on penalty kicks. The player is praised for kicking the ball in any direction. Then they are praised when the ball hits the upper corners of goal. So the whole look of the behavior has changed. So if the look of the behavior has changed, the A topography has been shaped. When we think about magnitude, we think about intensity, right? The power of the kick or the speed of the kick. Here, it's just about the look of the kick. Duration and frequency, are we changing any measurement aspect of this behavior? Well, no, we're not discussing measurement. The main dimension being shaped here is the topography. Remember the difference between shaping within topographies and across topographies. Thanks for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Please subscribe and share. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.